This week we're talking about objects in JavaScript, and we've we've been using objects a lot in uh, in terms of using existing or built-in objects. So we've seen objects like um, the console object, or we've uh, talked about things like the math object, and you know being able to use things like math.py, you know, to get access to uh, get access to different uh, methods and properties. We've talked about working with arrays. So we have, you know, there's, there's the array type, the regular expression type. Um, so we've had lots of, lots of different functions that we've been working with and objects. And so I want to talk today about how you, how you make your own, how you make your own objects. And so I want to go through and look at the the way that they're made, how they're different from objects in other languages, some of the main use cases that you have for them, and um, write some code and take you through some um, some of the newer things you can do with objects. So so let's dive into this. Okay. So in uh, in JavaScript, when we talk about an object. Uh, we could use other words and other programming languages use other words for it. So we could say that uh, an object in JavaScript is a map. So this idea of mapping a key to a value. So we're going to come back to this idea of key values. Or sometimes they're known as associative arrays. Or another term you'll hear a lot is a dictionary. So think about what a dictionary is. Dictionary is a list of words, big list of words in a language. And for each word, we have a definition. So we have this word, and then attached to the word is a definition. Each word appears once in the dictionary. And so if I wanted to, you know, if I want to look up something in a dictionary, how do I do it? I do it based on that word and its position inside the dictionary. I don't think about page numbers necessarily. I go, I know, I go and I find uh, that particular word and I look it up. So this idea of a, of a dictionary, a map, an associative array, they're all trying to deal with the fact that what we're really interested in here is the concept of having a key and a value pair that go together. So a key is some unique string. Um, it's, a, it's just any string, basically. And in, um, in an object, you can have lots and lots of keys. Each of those keys can have an associated value with it. So just like a word in a dictionary, the word is a key. Uh, the definition in the dictionary would be what we would consider to be a value here. So in JavaScript, a value can be any anything that you can, any type in the language. So those are things like strings and booleans and numbers. But you can also put things like arrays, functions, other objects. You can have these recursive tree structures. So you have a collection of key value pairs. Or you could say you have a collection of values, which is indexed by key. Um, okay, so it might be helpful for us to think about um, talking about this in terms of something that we know. So like we've been talking about arrays. So if I have an array like um, I, I have a list of, you know, A, B, and C, like so. Um, whoops, I need an equal sign. So I have list. List is this array of, of three elements. So the letter A is accessible in the list, in this collection. How? How do I get at it? Well, in this case, what I need to do is I need to use a positional index. And so we say that list at zero is going to give me back A. And if I were to say list at zero is equal to capital A, it would change it. So my list would now have capital ABC. So we can access what is at each position inside of the collection, or another way of saying this is we can access all of the elements of this collection 
based on an index, based on a positional index. So arrays have this property that, they're, that the position of the item in the list is significant. The order matters. Okay. Um, now an object is very similar to this, very similar to this. So I want to show you what an array really looks like in JavaScript. So an array in JavaScript is really a series of keys and values, only the key and the value here are, the key is a position, it's an index, it's zero, one, two, and so on, all the way up to the final position, the length minus one. And the value of each one of these is whatever we put into the array, A, B, C, okay? So if you think about an array as a collection of values whose index is, their, is the key, you can look it up according to this position. That's what you're thinking about when you're thinking about working with, with an array. So when we, talk about, um, when we talk about an object, what we're gonna do is instead of using zero, one, and two as indices, we're gonna switch to using strings. So we're going to still hold a, a collection of items, but instead of um, putting them at a particular position through an index, we're gonna use a string for the key name. So the order of those keys isn't gonna matter. Now in an array, the order really does matter, zero, one, two. So we have this, we have this property of the keys in an array, these indices, they, they grow. So zero, one, two, three, and so, because of this, we have this concept of positional, positional elements. In an object, we're gonna do the same kind of thing, but we're not gonna worry about the order of, of these keys or where they are. So objects are gonna store values uh, by giving them keys. We're not gonna worry about the order, and we can store as many of these key value pairs as we want in the exact same way that an array can hold as many uh, number, any number of elements by their position. So a key can only, it can only appear once inside of the object. So if you look at our array, we have the same thing. Like we can't put more than one thing at position zero. We can put a single value at position zero. We can put a single value at position one. So this, this position is important because it can only occur once in the collection, right? That's a property of the array. So we can do the same thing when we're talking about objects, but we're gonna be using key values instead of these numbers, and the key can only, um, can only you can only have it happen one time. So the, um, just like arrays in, uh, in JavaScript are dynamic, and they can grow or shrink, they can be modified, you can add things, remove things, all of that can happen after the collection is made. The same thing is true when you're talking about working with, with objects. Okay, so let me show you some let me show you some code. Let's let's do some examples here of what I'm talking about. Okay, so we said that um, a list is defined, uh, an array is defined with this literal syntax like this. Uh, this is an array with three things in it, for example, like that, right? How do I do an object? So if I wanted to have an object O. O is going to be a reference to an object. The empty object looks like this. So this is an empty object literal. In the same way that empty array literal, let um, whatever L is equal to that, right? So I can define an empty list. I can also define an empty object. So when you see these uh, curly braces, the curly braces are used to represent the fact that I am going to define, I'm going to define an object. Okay, so that's what an empty object looks like. So an object literal with um, a key value pair would look like this. Let O2 is equal to, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to put in a key and a value. Now I'm not gonna use the words key and value. What I'm gonna do instead is, let's say for example that I wanted to keep track of a course. So I'm gonna say that the course is web222, like so. 
So this object literal is different than this one in that it contains a single key value pair. So the, the key and the value go together. Now when, now when I put an item into an array, so for example, if I put, let's say I put the string web222 into an array like that. How are, how are these two things different? Well, it's sort of what I'm doing here when I do this. It's kind of like saying, I want to put this at position zero, right? I don't have to do this because it's implied, but that's really what I'm doing. I'm saying, put this value, this element, put it into the zeroth position of this array. Well, down here, what I'm doing is I'm saying, I want to put the string web222 into this object, O2, and I want to make it so that I can access it later by giving it a key name. So the key name that I'm going to use is course, like that, okay? So if I wanted to, let's do another one. So if I wanted, in my third example here, I'm going to do multiple key value pairs. So here, let's, let's add another one. How do I add another one? How do I add another one up here? What if I wanted to put a section up here, uh, NCC? What if I wanted to do that? I would do it with a comma, right? Well, I'm going to do the same thing down here. I'm going to put a comma, and then I'm going to put another key uh, value pair. So I'm going to say section NCC like that. So now what I have, I have two key value pairs. They're separated by a comma. And each key value pair has two parts. It has a key and it has a value that goes with it, a key and a value. And the value that you put in here, when you do a key, the key is a string. So this is some string that you're going to put in here. And the value is any, anything in, in JavaScript. And we'll see lots of examples of this as we go along. Now, the way that we write these, as they become longer, we tend to make them vertical. So what you're going to see people do is you're going to see people write this code. Let's do it another way. Let's, let's write it again. So here I'm going to do the same thing again. But you can see that this is starting to go wide. And if I had like another one, um, school, Seneca, and it, you know, it goes on and on and on. You start adding more and more of these. It, it gets really, really wide. Programmers don't like really, really wide lines because you don't want to scroll sideways. You want to scroll down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reformat this like so. I'm going to go down, and after each comma, I'm going to put a new line in like this, and then I'm going to move my, my literal um, closing brace over to the left. So this is another way that is very common to write object literals, in the same way that you will see people write um, their arrays like this. As they get longer, they'll start to go down. And so when you do this, I want you to always remember, you know, you need to indent. So anytime that you are, anytime you're defining something inside of a section or a block, here I'm defining a bunch of properties inside of uh, my object, I want to indent that one tab stop so that it's clear that these things go together. You'll also know when I'm type, notice when I'm typing this, it's pretty common for you to put a space here and here so that it's a little more readable. You just open it up a little bit so people can see that where does the what's the beginning. Now you don't have to do that, but it's pretty common. It's pretty common to have a space here. It's pretty common to put a space here. But again, some of this is personal preference. So you'll see different developers doing it different ways. Um, you will see some people putting a, a comma on the last line and some people will not put a comma on the last line when they're when they're defining these things. So just be aware of that. Um, the reason that they tend to do it is because of the way that Git works. Later on when you're working with Git and people are wanting to add a new element to the list, they don't want to change the line above by adding a comma. So it, it changes the, the history of the code. So you'll see people do it both ways. So just be aware of that when you're, when you're looking at this. Okay, so we've defined an object that has three key value pairs. They're really easy to see because I've put them on their own line. So I've got three of these things, three different string keys, course, section, and school, 
And then I've got uh, three strings that I'm, I'm including here on, on this object. Okay, so this is how we define this is how we define an object statically. Like I want to define an object so that when it gets, so when the program runs, it, it's going to create an object in memory that has this layout, this shape. When you're working with an object in JavaScript, you can put any key value pair you want into any object. So there, there doesn't have, there isn't a rule about what goes in an object and what doesn't go in an object, except for some syntactic errors and things that I'll tell you about, but you can decide to put anything you want into an object. All right, so let's talk about how you access these things. So let's say that I'm building up some um, information. This is a terrible variable name, so let's come up with a better variable name. Let's say that this is called course info. Okay, so here's a question. If I were to console.log course info, what would it do? What does course info hold? Well, course info is a reference to an object that is living in memory. Okay, so it's like a pointer to some other to this piece of memory that can grow. And uh, when I say course info, I'm referring to this whole thing here. So like if I were to let me just paste this in over here and show you what would happen. If I were to um, paste this in, you'll see that it has created an object for me right here and it's printed out this object. So this literal syntax produces an object in memory and then course info, you know, what is the type of course info? The type of course info is object. So this is this is how we create an object. We use this uh, the the braces in order to do in order to do a literal. How would I print out just the course name. How would I access this? Well, you've worked with uh, things like structs and so on in the past. And so, you know, this is probably not gonna surprise you, but if I wanted to get the course name, I can use dot notation. So I could say course info dot course. And that would let me get the reference to the object and then reach into the object and work with it. So if I have course info dot course, it gives me back the string. So this is this is how we would do a getter um, to be able to access uh, access something that you know is inside of the object. If I wanted to print out multiple things, I could say this is the course, and I could say course info dot section. And if I were to do this, let's just grab this line of code and run it prints out two things, right? Okay, so we have a way to reach inside of an object and access these things. So we can use this dot notation, course info dot, and then what comes after this is the name of a key. So when we put a key into the object, we're asking to get back the, we're asking to get the value that's associated with that key from inside of this. So when we talk about an associative array, what we're saying is that web222, right? If I wanna access this, it's not by position, it's by key. And so I'm gonna give you a key in order to do this, in order to be able to get this. So this is um, dot notation for accessing a key that's inside of the object. There's another notation that we can use. We can use this index notation. So we could say course info, and then we can use square brackets. So let's think about if you were use, you know, if I was looking at my list up here and I said list at zero, that is going to get me the zero with element from the list, right? So if I come down here and I say, get me course, what does that mean? It means go into the course info object, the, the object that is referred to by course info, find the course key using this string here, and then return to me the value that we would get. So if over here, if I were to say course info, and I said square bracket um, section, it returns it to me. And if I say course info dot section, it returns it to me. So those two ways of working are identical. 
which begs the question, why have two ways to do this at all? Why don't I always just do this? Like, wouldn't it be nicer to be able to just write course? Because you'll notice here, I'm having to create the string uh, manually. I'm creating the string, whereas here I get this nice syntax where I don't have to create a string. I can just refer to this as if it was a name on this object. Like, it's just a property on the object that I can access. Why do we have both of these things? Okay, so there's a couple of reasons for this. One reason why we would want to do this is if we were accessing something, uh, if we were accessing a key value using a variable. So let's say for example that I had let k equals course. So I want to access the key that is stored in the value k. How, how on earth would you write this? Like, this is a problem that isn't solvable in a language that doesn't let you do dynamic runtime work like JavaScript does. Because what if I write this? What if I say course info at k? So if I if I were to say course info dot k, what would it return to me? What's your guess? Will it work? No, it doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't crash my program though. So I want you to notice that there's no error produced. If you ask for a key, and so let's say for example, I ask, I ask for a section, but I make a spelling mistake. I flip the I and the O around, what will it do? Well, it'll look inside the object. It will find that there is no key named S-E-C-T-O-I-N, and it will return back to me undefined. So you can think of an object as you know, if you ask it for something that doesn't exist, it will give it to you. <laughs> Does that make sense? If I say, give me this thing that doesn't exist, JavaScript says, here you go. Here's the thing that doesn't exist. It's undefined. It's, it's never been defined before. It won't blow up your program. So there's a lot of safety here, but there's also quite a few bugs that are, are possible from this. Whenever you pull something out of an object, you always run the risk of this thing being undefined. The same way that if I ask for you know, uh, list at 6,719, it's gonna also give me back undefined. So it doesn't blow up my program. It doesn't go off the end of the array and read in memory that it shouldn't. What it does instead is it just says, I'm unable to get you a value from here, so I'm gonna give you undefined. So over here, if we were to ask for K as, you know, using dot notation, it would fail because it's going to literally look for this. So this this here would be the same as saying, um, give me course info at k using k as a key name. But we you know we don't have anything up here called k. It doesn't exist. So because it doesn't exist, it's not going to work. However, this will work right here. Why does this work? It works because what JavaScript's gonna do is it's going to evaluate what K is. It's going to get this, it's gonna take this expression, which in this case is just a single variable, and it's going to create a string, and then it's gonna look for that string in the keys of the object, and it's gonna find that K contains course, so now this is gonna work. So this is an extremely powerful technique that we have for being able to store items and retrieve items from an object dynamically at runtime without necessarily knowing the name that we want. It's incredibly common for you to do this, where you know the name that you want and you just say, I want course, I want section, I want school, that's what I want. And it's also really common for people to do stuff like this, where they pass variables around and then they use those variables to reach inside of an object and get access to something that looks like this. If, what if I wrote code like this? What if I said, um, let i equals uh, one, and then I said, give me list at i. Would you have any problem with that? I mean, this is really what we're doing when we do a for loop, right? For let i equals zero, i is less than list at length, i plus plus. And then we say, you know, let item equals list at i. That's what we're doing right there. So we are using i, we're using a positional, in this case, an index, 
We don't know what it is until runtime. At runtime, it's going to change. It's going to go through the loop and it's going to update. It's going to update and do all this sort of thing. Down here, I'm doing the exact same thing. I'm defining a variable, and I'm saying I want to I want to get the key that is defined by the variable k. Okay. So when we're talking about dot notation versus this index notation, why would you use one over the other? One of the reasons is you want to use um, you want to be able to use variables. Okay. So what's another reason? There are lots of uh, keywords in the language. So for example, the keyword let or the keyword function or the keyword for things like this, lots of lots of words which JavaScript interprets with a special meaning because they are keywords in the language and we can't use them in here. So if I ever wanted to, to put one of these in here, if I ever had to access one or work with one, course info, I can't say dot four because that's gonna cause a problem. But what I could do is I could say, I'm gonna index inside here and I'm gonna use, uh, I'm gonna use a keyword, some reserved word that otherwise wouldn't be allowed like that. Or maybe I want to have some weird thing inside here, like maybe my key name starts off with an at symbol, at symbol ABC, something like that. So if I tried to write course info at, uh, at ABC, it's gonna cause a problem. JavaScript is gonna trip over it. So what we do is we, we, hide, we hide the problematic text inside of a string or inside of a variable and then we can index into it like this you know so this would be odd characters so another example of this would be spaces like if i had some name right i can't say course info dot some space name that won't work right so the space is meaningful I can't, but I want the space to be in the key name for some reason, then I need to be able to use this index notation. So you're gonna see both of these used, depending on the scenario that you're in, you're gonna see both of them get pulled out quite frequently. They're, they're both really, really useful. Okay, so let me talk to you about some reasons why you might want to use objects when you're, when you're writing your code. What are some common use cases for these things? All right, so let's let's imagine for a, for a moment um, that you are interested in. Let's say you have to represent some data in a program, and you need to be able to create these complex data types. So, th what does JavaScript give you? Strings, numbers, booleans, right? We have these basic types, but Often, I need to be able to put a few of those together in order to be able to do something useful. So let's say, for example, that I want to be able to represent um, the uh, position of Toronto on a map. And so we have, you know, we have, we have two numbers that we're interested in. So 43.6532, yes, I had to look this up. I don't have it off the top of my head and negative 79.3832. So we have latitude and longitude, longitude positions uh, that we'd like to represent. So what are our options? How could we do this? Okay, so let's think about what we know how to do. So these are both floating point numbers, right? So we could say um, let longitude is equal to this, let sorry, latitude is equal to this and longitude is equal to this. So that is one solution to the problem and it works. We could, we could, we could do this. Um, we might run into some problems though because everywhere that we need to work with these, we're always gonna have to work with two variables. So if we wanna pass this to a function, we're gonna to have to pass this to a function as uh, two different variables. And then we get into problems where, um, how do we return these back from functions? So we could invent some other syntax for this. Uh, for example, 
we might say um, let Toronto is equal to let's do it this way what if we made an array okay this is maybe this is better so now it's possible for me to pass Toronto around instead of, let's do this, Toronto, uh, latitude, Toronto, longitude, like this. Do it as an array versus do it as a uh, set of numbers. Like so. Now this isn't bad. Um, if I wanted to access the latitude, how would I do it? I would say Toronto at uh, at zero, and I would say Toronto at one. So if I needed to get those values out of there. So the thing about doing it with an array is that the only the only way to express the meaning of these of what these two numbers are is through position. And Toronto at zero versus Toronto at one, if, if this is deep, deep down in my program, so let's say I've got lots and lots of lines and then somewhere down, way down in my program, I'm working with Toronto at zero and Toronto at one, you're gonna have to scroll back up and you're gonna have to try and remember, did I do, how do what is this? What are these numbers? And if this data gets even more complex, it's gonna be hard to remember, you know, what's at position, Toronto at 17, you know, this starts to break down as you add more and more data to this. Okay, so let's think about another way we could do this. What if um, I took this and I did it as an object literal? Okay, so this is Toronto as an array. This is gonna be Toronto as an object. And so instead of having these uh, square braces i'm gonna i'm gonna turn them into round round braces like this it's, or uh curly braces rather and next what i need to do is i have to i have to give a key for each one of these things now up here we called these things latitude and longitude so that's actually what i'm going to do here i'm going to say this is the latitude and this is longitude like this and if we wanted to, we could split this on a couple of lines like this. And now we've defined Toronto as a complex type, which is made up of two numbers. And we've also been able to name those numbers. So if I need to, here we said, if I need to get the latitude, it's Toronto array at zero. If I need to get it here, I would say Toronto dot latitude like this. So you can see that my program becomes much, much easier to read because I'm not worried anymore about the data type. I'm thinking in terms of the data. I'm reaching inside to the object reference Toronto and I'm grabbing the value that exists for latitude like this, okay? So we can create um, complex, complex data types like this. Okay, let's do another one. Let's um, let's make a user. What does you know? What does a user have? A user might have um, a first name. Uh, so this is their first name, a last name, a last name. They might have an email address. Um, first dot last at email. Dot com. They might have, um, they might be logged in or not. So in our system, we're modeling the concept of a user. So I might say um, logged in is false. So here we've got a mix of string types, but we've also introduced a Boolean type. Last, um, you know, are they logged in? And the last time that they logged in, last uh, login time might be a date. So we might have a new date. And in here, you know, we populate the information about whatever, whatever the last time they logged in. So we can have strings, we can have booleans, we can have the, the date and time that, um, you know, they last logged in, etc. 
when we're uh, trying to model this. So this this idea, this can grow, you know, this, we can put, whoops, lots and lots and lots of things down here. It can keep going down and we can store lots and lots of data. And each one of these things can be named. So any anything you can think of in here, numbers, you know, um, a, a user might have like, um, like a, a level, like some sort of privilege level. So we might say level is equal to three. You know, we can have numbers. Um, I missed my comma here. Numbers, Boolean strings, whatever, all those kinds of things are, are really useful. Now, what's great about this is I want you to think about what we've been doing so far. So imagine that I had a function that did something with a user. So for example, I have a function called login. And what does it take? It takes, it takes user information. So let's pass in the first name, the last name, the email address, etc. right? We, we wanna pass this stuff in. So in order to do this, I have to pass in what? Like three, three or more arguments. What if instead of doing that, I just pass in the user object? So now what I've done is I've made it possible to skip having to send in all of these individual values and I can pass a complex type into a function. So this is a really common thing that you're gonna see in a function. When I have a function f, instead of passing it all kinds of arguments like this, and some of these, some of these arguments are optional, and some of these arguments need a default value or don't have a default value, like there's all this complex stuff going on with these different um, arguments that we do. Instead of doing all that, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pass a single, um, I'm gonna pass a single object in, and if I need to access A, I'm gonna say options dot, uh, dot A. I'm gonna reach into the options op dot A. So for example, I might say if options dot A is defined, then do something. Do something with, uh, do something with that value. Okay, like for example, up here, what if I wanted to log in a user? So I might say user dot logged in, equals true, right? I pass the user object and then I reach into the user object and I access something and I make a change to that, okay? So this is a really common thing that we're gonna do. We're gonna use objects to, to combine a whole bunch of data and then pass it into a function. Another thing that's really common is we've been writing lots of functions, um, and at the end of the function, we want to return something. You know, we want to return the number six, or we want to return the value n, or whatever it is, or like return a total, something like that. This is what all of our functions look like. And up until this point, we've been limited because the only thing we can return is a single value. What if you wanted to return the total and the average? So you calculate the total and the average for a bunch of numbers, and you wanna return both from this one function, how would you do that? We didn't used to have a way to do that because you can't say return the total and the average like this, you know, return two things. You can't say return the total on this line and then uh, return the average on this line, that won't work. But what we can do instead is we could create a total is equal to whatever, 1, 000, you know, 120, average is equal to uh, 56, 56, let's say. So this function f returns a, let's say we have a function called calculate, and it does all the work up here, and then it returns these down here. So if I was to call calculate, I would say let result equals calculate and result now has a total and result has an average. So I can, I can work with the thing that I get back from this function to be able to do, uh, to be able to do, you know, access the pieces of this information that I'm interested in. So we use, we use objects in JavaScript, not just in JavaScript, in lots of languages, but in JavaScript, we use it to create complex types. 
We use it to represent lists of arguments. So we use it to combine a whole bunch of things and then simplify being able to pass data to a function. And we also use it in order to make it possible to return more than one thing. We're still only returning one thing, right? Like if you think about it, what we're doing here is we're returning an object, except that we're putting data in the object before we return it. So we're returning multiple things, we're passing multiple things, but we're able to work with just this single thing to be able to, to do this. And another thing that's really um, something that we're going to do a lot of is we're going to work with um, we're going to work with multiple instances of objects at once. So, like, let me go back here for a second, and and let's grab this um, latitude and longitude. Okay, so let me just grab these two things here, and I'll show you another piece of code. So imagine imagine we have two different ways of representing this latitude and longitude, right? And what if I wanted to have multiple points? So what if I wanted to have a bunch of points on a map, not just a single point on a map? Well, one thing I could do is I could make an array out of those points. So here's an array and I can represent multiple. So let's say I have another point. Another point is here. And this might be easier to see if I put it on multiple lines. So I have an array of arrays, right? Like so. So I have an array of arrays. Okay, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it would be to create an array of objects. And again, so here's another one, here's another one, or an array of, let's grab this user, an array of users. Let's do that. So if I said, whoops, if I said, um, I have a user, comma, I have another user, comma, I have another user, etc. So what we're achieving here is we're making it possible to have either one or multiple uh, instances of, uh, you know, things, but instead of having to always work with positional arguments, so like imagine getting the, imagine getting me this longitude value out of the array, how would you do it? You have to reach into the array. So let's say this is called points. Uh, let points equal. Then I would have to say points at zero, one. So this is position one. And then within position one, what do I have to do? Then I have to reach inside there and I have to get the second element in order to get this number right here. Like, that's fine. You can figure this out. Like, that's not hard code. But if I ask you to figure out what's going on here, you're going to have to take a minute to understand what's going on. What if I said to you that I want you to get me the second, um, long the longitude for the second point here? Well, then it becomes, you know, points at one dot longitude like this. I'm reaching in. So really what I'm saying is get me the, get me the object out of the array, this object right here, and then reach into it and get me the long longitude for that, you know, or down here, if I had, if this was users, whoops, users, and I want to say uh, users at, at two dot email, something like that, right? I can go through and I can get access to all of these. Or if I wanted to loop through all of these, you know, users dot for each and each each one of these iterations gives me a user. And now I can reach in and I can say user dot email and I can do something with, you know, console dot log everybody's email address or something like that. I can go through and work with these things. So being being able to work with these these uh, these objects to name things is really one of the most powerful features of them is that I'm not, it's gonna help your code to be, 
to be documented in ways that are, are tricky to do otherwise, and to be able to pass in complex pieces of data into a function or return complex pieces of data from a function gives you a lot more flexibility when you're trying to you know, put all of this together. Okay, a couple more high level things about working with these uh, objects and then I'll pause this and we'll, I'll do some more follow up in another video. So the next thing is I wanna talk about how you modify data. So if I have an object O is equal to uh, name web222, like so, so I define an object O and O has all of this on here. What would it mean? And maybe we can do it over here just to show you, this might make it more, Okay, so if I say o, whoops, o dot name, o dot name is equal to this, right? So o dot name is a getter. If I say o dot name, whoops, o dot name, that's a getter. It's going to get the value out. It's going to go and find the key, and it's going to return this back to me. All right, so the, another one we will use is we'll use o.name is equal to web222. This is a setter. So if I say o.name is equal to web222, then o now looks different. o has a name key, but the value has been changed. So I can get the value or I can set the value. And depending on whether I use it as an L value or an R value, like is it on the left-hand side of an equal sign or the right-hand side of an equal sign? So what I mean by that, like for example, if I said if o.name, what would that code mean? Well, in order to understand something like this, we have to understand what happens when you request something that isn't there. So if you said, oh, we talked about this, o dot, I don't know. Uh, o.school, for example. Well, there is nothing called O at school. So if I were to say, if O at school, this is going to return undefined, which is falsy, right? So it wouldn't do anything here. Or if I say O.name, in other words, you're saying, is name defined? Is there any, is there any value associated with this key? Okay. So this is working with these as uh, getters and setters. Now, how about this? What if I said o.school is equal to Seneca? Does that work? So o.school equals Seneca. That does work. It works even though we didn't have a key inside the object when we created it called school. This will work. So if you look at o now, o has two key value pairs, name and school, they're both inside there. So when I'm using the setter, I can either, um, here, I was able to update an existing key. Here I create and store a new key and value, right? Update an existing value for a key. Sorry, let me be more clear. <laughs> Let's try this one more time. Update an existing keys value. That's probably a better way to say it. And create and store a new, a new key value pair. So the object is dynamic. You can change it after you create it. That's not a problem. Okay, so how do you get rid of things? How would I get rid of school? So when you talk about getting rid of school, I want you to think about the fact that there's two parts to this school key here. So we have the key school, but we also have the value Seneca. So if I were to say o.school is equal to null, so what am I doing? I'm storing null at the key equals school. So if I, here, if I say o.school is equal to null, and then I look at this, you'll see that school as a key still exists. It's in there, but the value that is attached to it is undefined, or sorry, it is null. It's not undefined, it is, it has been, it has a value and its value is null. It doesn't exist. 
So this is the way for you to essentially clear out a value. If you wanna get rid of a value, you can null that value out. Another thing you can do is you can delete the key completely. So you can say delete o.school and this will uh, remove school key and associated value. So if I say here, I want to delete o.school. Now I have an object that doesn't have a school key on it. And because it doesn't have a school key on it, it also doesn't have a school value. So it has been, it's been removed. So it's not there. Okay. Um, okay, good. So I think this is a good place to wrap this uh, particular video up. And I wanna do, I wanna talk about a few other things. So I'll come back in follow-ups to do that. But I wanted you to get a sense when you're just when you're working with these objects and you're trying to get a sense of the syntax, uh, it can be tricky because it's all it's it's very new, and especially doing things like uh, let's go up here this kind of stuff, you know where you can do dot notation and you can do uh, index notation and the fact that requesting a key that doesn't exist will give you back an undefined value those sorts of things they aren't they aren't necessarily obvious. Also that you can create and then update these things at runtime so that you have more, you know, more properties that get added even though the object's already been created. Okay, let's pause it there and we'll carry on in another video.